Let me welcome all of you to Conoco Baptist Church. We're glad to see you here this morning. We have a number of people to pray for this morning, and uh, especially our team uh, in Africa and others as well. And uh, as I begin this morning, numbers of you knew Mac Arnold that was pastor at Portage Grove for years and years and years. He passed away this week. And uh, we need to remember, I think her name was Joan or Joanne. What? It was Joanne. Joanne. All right, thank you. Uh, and the family, and Mac Arnold Jr. as well. And uh, so the Dan Sheffield had his funeral yesterday in Tennessee. And so pray for him and his safety uh, in traveling back uh, this way as well. As far as uh, announcements go, I don't know of anything this particular week there we need to keep in our mind the Vacation Bible School in July. Uh, we need to remember our church-wide picnic, which is the first Sunday in August, and uh, we need to get ready for that as well. And then are there other announcements that you want to make or need to make that you represent a part of the ministry of the church? Any of them? All right, well, we're going to have a welcome time right now, so let's uh, stand to our feet and let's uh, go and greet one another in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you're not rusty preaching? 
Yeah. Like, what? You're not rusty at <laughs> So, we need to remember the Arnold family in our prayers. I've already mentioned that. And uh, we have a dear friend at Calvary Baptist Church, the uh, Damaris Hennage. Uh, they celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary last Saturday. And, uh, but uh, I think it was on Friday that she started getting sick. And uh, he had to call 911. She has been in the ER from that time until just recently, or she still is. And uh, they have 23 people in line to get a room at Upper Chesapeake in Bel Air. And so we need to pray about all of those individuals that are in the halls and all that kind of thing, uh, as well as the uh, Roy and the Maris and, and uh, their family at this point. I haven't heard any late word on uh, Damaris, but they were waiting to find out what the last scan showed. The first one showed an obstruction. Uh, so they don't know exactly what caused it or what it is. And so we need to remember uh, her in our prayers and the family in, in our prayers. Jason, I wonder if you would uh, word our prayer this morning. Let's pray together and join Jason in prayer. Father, we uh, just thank you for this time, and uh, we lift up Dr. Carter to you as uh, he delivers your message spoken through him, Lord. And uh, Lord, I just ask that uh, you, you open our ears to this message, you uh, soften our hearts, so we can uh, let this message sink in and, uh, and apply to our lives. And let us not uh, just come to this building to worship you, but uh, remember you throughout the week, Lord. Uh, Father, we lift up the uh, Africa team as they're coming home. Uh, we lift up uh, their safe travel, their safe uh, arrival, and uh, for for the those that are going in the van to pick them up to uh, to also come back safely. <coughs> just uh, thank you for being able to come to your house this morning. For it's in uh, your precious son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much.
If y'all would please stand with us, we're going to sing a hymn. We got the lyrics up on the screen for you.
let me express my appreciation to uh, Daniel for uh, doing some last minute work for us. I uh, had been texting back and forth with Rusty and knowing that there might be a possibility that I would be preaching this morning, so I spent a number of hours last night and this morning, early, praying and uh, <clears throat> seeking the will of the Lord in, in relationship to the message. And apparently Amber texted Betty Sue, uh, but we've been having problems with uh, the communication part, the email, that's Wi-Fi, whatever. <laughs> and uh, she got the message, and uh, we were packing up the other two that we had, uh, uh, Mariah and uh, Tabby, to bring church today. And so apparently she didn't have time to tell me. So I walked in this morning and Amber was at the organ. And uh, she said, uh, by the way, what, what is your uh, subject? How old it is. And I said, my subject? I said, where's Rusty? He says, Rusty's not here. And I said, oh. So then she to I told her my uh, uh, subject. And uh, then I thought it would be great if we could get some of this on PowerPoint. <laughs> that was waking everybody up. <laughs> and... Uh, so we started with the uh, subject and the scripture. And then uh, after I was uh, praying and, uh, and spent my time along with the Lord and, and uh, over the message and scriptures, I walked into the sound room and Dan Daniel was there and Amber. And I said, could we possibly, possibly, Get just a just an inkling or a brief thing here, because uh, it'd be helpful to our people in regards to, as you know, the kind of messages that I preach can be lengthy. Uh, <laughs> so the subject that I'm going to be speaking about today is the power of the cross. When you start reading First. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1 and 10. Paul is begging the church at Corinth to get together. They've got the visions, they've got problems. He's saying, get together. Come on, get together. He says it in a different way. He says, Now I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. That's the way he speaks. And uh, then he goes on to say, and I want to tell you about baptism. Uh, he said baptism is important, but I haven't been called to baptize people. And then right after that, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 18, he talks about what the real answer to the division <coughs> and to the differences of opinion are. And he says there is nothing that will bring a church together and there is Nothing that will put the right priorities on what the church does than the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
And so if you will stand in reverence to the reading of God's Word, 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are doing what? Perish. Perishing. But to us who are being what? Saved. Saved it is the what? Power. Power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness, watch this, of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign. The Greeks want wisdom. But we preach Christ what? Crucified. Crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, and that's me, and that's you, who are in Christ. Those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God of God. Would you bow with me as we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we ask for the illumination of your Holy Spirit upon your Word. We ask for the anointing of your Spirit upon your servant. We ask for the opening of hearts and ears and lives to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for our loving us. Thank you for putting up with us. And thank you, O oh God, for leaving us a true pathway to victory. A victory that must come through the cross. Because as the songwriter says, it is the way of the cross that leads home. Leads home, home to you. And Lord, I pray today there's someone here that is not saved. That they will be drawn to pay close attention to that which is the power of the cross. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. When Jesus hung on the cross, He was suspended between earth and heaven. When He was put on the cross, His arms were stretched out. Those arms were nailed to the cross, but they were stretched out to a lost and dying world. 
His feet were also crucified. And they were crucified to the point that at this point he could not do what he had done through 33 years of life. Minister to others as he walked. Touch others as he walked. Heal others as he walked. His feet, his hands were now still. But praise God. His voice was not silenced. And as he hung there on that cross, he had some last words to say uh, to those few that had loved him and many that had hated him. And the first thing that he said from the cross, and you can look in your Bibles, Luke chapter 23, verse 34. The first thing that he said was a statement of Father what? Forgive them for they know not what they do. So I asked the question, what were they doing? They were nailing Jesus to the cross. They had stripped his robe off. He had viewed them as they were casting lots for what part of the raiment and clothing that they could get. Then they were those to the right and left of him on the cross at this time that were scoffing and ridiculing and there were those that were close to the cross saying, you saved others. Save yourself. Can you imagine being on the cross like that? Dying, shedding your blood, naked, exposed to the entire world, and being able to have the courage to look on all of this and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's a cry for mercy. It's a cry for mercy and Jesus was saying to us there is no situation, there is no circumstance that can come in your life that you should not have the same commitment to forgive others who you would rather not forgive. Amen? In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, Love your enemies. Was he loving their, the enemies as he looked down on the cross? Yes. He said, Love your enemies in Matthew 5 44, if you're looking for it. And bless those who curse you. Do we do that? This would be a better church. This would be a better world. If those who knew Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior did not disdain those who were against them but rather love them and bless them. And then, and then, the rest of that passage says, and pray for them. 
So you have the loving, you have the blessing, and you have the praying for those who have harmed and would harm you. And Jesus gave us, no doubt, that lesson and its power from the cross of Jesus Christ. The next thing that our Lord said was from Luke chapter 23 verse 43 a statement of assurance. Do you remember that? Two things. One on the right, one on the left. One rail in his teeth. Scoff the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, hanging there on the cross. But the other one said, This man has done nothing. Are you folks listening? <coughs> and Jesus turned to the one that said that. And then he listened closely to what else he had to say. And he said, remember me, Lord. Remember me, Lord. When you come into your kingdom. That's power. That's power. Remember me, and that's what every single one of us who are in Christ have said to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is, remember me! And Jesus says the same thing to us that he said to that repentant thief on the cross. Words of assurance. Today. Today! Today, not tomorrow. Not this afternoon, not tonight, not another moment, but right now you will be with me where? In paradise. In paradise. You want to know what happens to you when you die? Jesus told it from the cross. He said it's today that you're going to be with me in my kingdom. Praise God. <laughs> That there is not an empty place. But Christ fills it all. The fullness of God. And you, so you see the mercy that Jesus teaches us on the cross. You see the assurance that is received through the power of the cross. But then I want us to look at John chapter 19. Verse 26 to 27. And here is Jesus was on the cross. <coughs> he was looking down. And who was close to him? His mother. His mother Mary. Jesus in agony. Jesus <laughs> bleeding. Jesus dying. Jesus thirsty. Jesus hungry. And he looked down on his mother and then he saw the one disciple that did not forsake him. John, the beloved apostle of Jesus Christ. The one who leaned on his bosom in the last summer. The one that Jesus called the beloved disciple. So what did Jesus say? He looked at Mary and he said, we're going to take time out. He said, behold. That's what that means. We're going to take the time out from all of this agony to create a new relationship that the cross creates. So what did he say? Woman, behold your son. That's a relationship. John was not her son. And then he said, 
to the Apostle John, Hey, son, behold your mother. They had no relationship with one another, but Jesus just created it, a new relationship in Christ. Now, I have a physical mother. I had a physical father. I had physical siblings. There were my brothers and my sisters. But hey, when I came to know Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, I got a new family. Amen? Amen. Jesus, through the cross, created a new relationship. And I'm grateful for that new relationship. I love my mother. I love my father. But I also love all the other mothers and all the other fathers and all the other brothers and all the other sisters in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you, there's power in what happened at the cross of Calvary. Amen. Now Jesus said, If we forsake our mother, who will give us other mothers. If we forsake our brothers, who will give us other mothers. What is that? It's a new relationship. New relationship. And by the way, the physical relationship is going to pass away. So what are we going to have if we do not have another relationship, the new relationship in Jesus Christ? Nothing. But when we have in Christ, we have the kingdom of God. And you see, I'm glad that my blessed Lord created that new relationship. Because in Corinthians, doesn't it say, doesn't it say, now those who are created in Christ, are a new creation. Didn't say that. <coughs> and we're not as grateful for that new creation and that new relationship as we should be. But then, but then from the cross, Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, Jesus hanging on the cross, spent in between heaven and earth, looking at all of this that's going on, in agony, in pain, in writhing pain, crown of thorns on his head, pushed down. Jesus, no doubt, felt deserted. Right? Say, so how in the world could he say what he said? Well, what did he say? Eloi, Eloi, it's harmless so what the night. Which is interpreted, my God. My God. I want to know, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me on this cross? What's that all about? It's all about being honest with God. That's another thing that Jesus indeed teaches us from the cross. There's power. But, but you see, the power is not in the wood. The power is not in the nails. But the power is in Jesus. The person on the cross. That's where the power is. But it's still the preaching of the cross. That is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that would believe. Well, you say, wait a minute. What do you mean about dishonesty with God? People are 
generally asking me questions after the sermon and after the worship service about scripture, about certain things. And the question is, when you really feel like telling God how it is, should you? My answer is yes. Jesus told the Father, I feel forsaken. I feel deserted. I feel as though there are no friends but all enemies. Can you imagine? Well, that's what Hebrews says. Hebrews 4, 16 says. Look at it. Do you think Jesus came boldly to the Father when he said, my God, my God, why has he, you, you forsaken me? Absolutely he was bold. He was absolutely bold. And Hebrews 4, 16 says, now let us, and who is that? That's right. Let us therefore come what? What? Oh, and where? Do you get it? I have a right to be honest with my father. And I'm glad I do. Because I need to be able to be honest with him and reveal the feelings that he knows I already have. I'm not telling him, by the way, anything new. <laughs> he already knows it. But I'm so glad that I can be bold and enter into the throne of grace. And then it says, for what? That we may obtain what? Mercy. Mercy. And what? Find grace when and help in our time of need. Well, I think that our Lord had a time of need. And so he tells us, don't be afraid. Certainly reverence the Father. But don't be afraid to be honest with him. And I would challenge you not to be afraid to be honest with your Heavenly Father. One of the greatest difficulties in families is the lack of honesty. The lack of honesty. The wife is afraid to be honest with the husband. The husband's afraid to be honest with the wife. The child is afraid to be honest with the parents. Have you ever noticed when you ask and something happens and you ask a child, did you do this? No. <laughs> and then in a few minutes, One of the siblings says, when they ask, what happened? She hit me. If we were more honest, we would have a better life. Jesus was perfect honest. Preachers are afraid, by the way, to be honest with their membership. You say, what? Uh-huh. Uh, members, ah, uh -huh, are afraid to be honest with their pastor. And it makes a mess. 
So Jesus said, I, I, I showed you, I demonstrated to you how you should be. And when I had that honesty with the Father, But then, in the next passage, John 19, 28, Jesus said two words. He said, I thirst. You mean Jesus was thirsty? I, 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 I you know, I, I just thought that he made the rivers and he made the seas and he actually created the water as the rain came down from the heaven and the springs broke up. So, you mean he was thirsty? Jesus said, I am thirsty. But this is not the first time that Jesus said he was thirsty. You see, Jesus is God. But he's also a man. And he is divine, but he is what? Also human. So in John chapter 4, and you can look at it, he chose to send his disciples on when he came into Samaria. But he just decided he would go to the well, the well of water. Why did he want to go to the well of water? He was thirsty. Actually, the Bible says, and Jesus was tired. He was weary. Can you believe that? The Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, was tired? I told you a while ago. He is divine, but He is also human. He's like us so that we can become like Him. And so there at that place in John 4, Samaritan woman, Jesus said, give me to drink. And now what is it? Those are precious uh, passages to me in John chapter 4. It's a great soul winner's text, by the way, and how it witnessed to others. But he said, I thirst. And of course, they took that spear, the sponge, dipped it in the sour wine that was prepared, and lifted it to the lips of our Savior, so that he could quench his thirst. So then we go. The next thing that we notice is in 1930, John 1930. And here it is, we have three English words. It is what? Finished. The Aramaic uh, is telestai. It, it's like an artist drawing that last stroke across that paint. That's what the word means. Have you ever seen a painter and they that last thing they add to their scene to make it? And they It's finished! Jesus said. By the way, he didn't say, I am finished. To God's honor, to God's glory. Because he wasn't finished. But he finished what God called him to do. Right? That last stroke on the plan of redemption, the plan of salvation, a process. It. 
it's done. By the way, there are people that try to add something to salvation. And Jesus said right then and there, there's nothing to add. Salvation is salvation. It's not salvation plus. But there are some people who preach that it's not just salvation. You have to add to your salvation. Some add baptism, by the way. Let me tell you something. You do not have to be baptized in order to go into the kingdom of God. If you are saved, you are saved. Amen. However, if you want to follow the Lord, then you need and should be baptized. Because he commanded that we be baptized. But just like Paul said, I haven't been pre called to preach baptism. Now, if you want to baptize, go baptize. But he said, I'm going to do what? Preach the cross of what? Christ. Completion of redemption is done. Now we go... And we look at Luke 23, 46. And by the way, the first six hours on the cross, there was light. From the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness. In the time of darkness, what happened? What happened? <coughs> the what? The veil. The veil, exactly. The veil that was before the Holy of Holies was split from top to bottom. Why? In order that you and I could have free access to our heavenly Father. That's why. But now, what was the saying in Luke 23, 46? What was it? You want to listen to it? Father. Father. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. My spirit. But do you know what the spirit of man is? It's his breath. How do I know? Because it says that when Jesus said this, that he was God. They didn't have to do anything to him. He was dead before he was taken to the cross. His breath was gone. Have you ever seen a person dying? Have you ever seen a person dying and and they're gasping for breath. And then all of a sudden, it's gone. The Spirit is gone. And what happens is, in Genesis it says, and, and the Lord took from the dust of the earth, and that he breathed into the nostrils of man, the breath of life. And that became a living soul. Now let's back up. What happens when God doesn't continue to breathe into man's nostrils the breath of life? He dies. There is nothing that can revive when God quits breathing in two. Have you ever watched a person die? You and me will observe that. 
Some of you may know the testimony about Mac Arnold, dear friend. His wife just got there in time to say her byes, let it, let her him know that she loved him. She was holding his hand, and apparently Mac's other hand was extended. And guess what? She was telling him how much she loved him. This came from his daughter-in-law, Mac Arnold Jr.'s wife. <clears throat> they watched, apparently, she could see. The breath stopped, and right out of the corner of the eye came a tear down the cheek. Praise God! He will wipe away all tears. Amen. And he did it right then and there. And to be absent from this life is to be present with the Lord. Now you see on there, Jesus taught us how to face death. There's no better place to be than in the Father's hands. Amen? Amen. Your safety in the Father's hands. Your security in the Father's hands. And you know Jesus talked about this. Listen. I think it's in John chapter 10. But Jesus talked about it. <clears throat> he said, I, Jesus, am in the Father's hands. Right? But he didn't stop there. And here's our security as believers. But you are in my hands. Now those hands are still open, right? Can you get out of those uh, hands? Jesus said, no. No man can pluck you out of my Father's hands. And then the Lord wanted us to have a triple bond of security. So in the Father's hand, in His hands, and we are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of our redemption. Now friends, that's something to be praising God for. Amen. You're saved. You're saved. Exclamation. You lost. You're lost. Exclamation point. So where does this lead us? It leads to an invitation. That's where it is. Remember that repentant thief on the cross? You could call it his eleventh hour before he died. Remember him, he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember what Jesus told him? Today you shall be with me in paradise. Now, if that other thief had said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, guess what? Same thing. Same thing. The Lord's not going to turn anyone away that comes to me. Amen. How do I know that? Because I came to it and it didn't turn me away. That's how I know it. So I plead with you this morning through the power of the cross of Jesus Christ and the preaching of the cross. I plead with you this morning that if you're lost, that you'll come to Jesus this morning and be saved. Now, Jesus has done, as I've seen, showed you on the cross, He has done everything that He can do for you or for me. He's done it. 
Amen? And it's up to us now. It's up to us now. To say, Lord, thank you for dying in my place to save me. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I commit myself to you to live for you and one day to die for you. And, and Jesus will take your hand basically just like he took the hand of the repentant thief. And say, come, my child. If you're here today and you are saved. And you don't have a church home right now that the Lord has been moving you toward kind of when you go, today's the day. Where did you do that? Many times people say, well, I was waiting for the pastor to come back. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Pastor's not Jesus. And you may not live to next Sunday. Amen. So it's today. Remember what, what Jesus said to the they, He didn't say tomorrow, tonight, or until Jesus comes back, he said, Jesus said, right now, it's settled to be settled today. But if you're a believer and you're not, I don't like this term, but if you're not churched, housed, part of the fellowship, maybe that's better. You need to be. And so I will be here to receive you. Certainly I'm not the pastor. Uh, but I am a servant of God. And uh, I would welcome you to come. And this fellowship would welcome you to come. And uh, as many others have come. And be a part of this fellowship. Because whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be what? No exceptions. No exceptions. Let's pray. Our Father, today, you have spoken through your word, through the cross. And I pray, Lord, that people have listened to your call. And as invitation comes, I just pray that we will listen to you, to your spirit. And Lord, I pray that before this service is done, that there will be a new child in your kingdom and there will be a new relationship created in Christ Jesus. And I pray for those that are believers that need to commit themselves to a fellowship to be on fire for the Lord. And so... The songwriter says, set my soul afire, Lord, set my soul afire. And I pray that, I pray that today for all of us, that the flame will ignite again in our hearts for our Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand together, and you have the invitation, the Holy Spirit calling you then I'll wait for you and I'm here for you. The altar is open. You need to come and say, Lord, I have missed a long time the power that's in the preaching of the cross. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be.
want us to bow our heads and permit prayer. You've heard the message. I want you just to have a little talk with Jesus. Just you. Just you personally with your Savior in these moments to follow. Together across the aisle, we'll have our song of addiction.